had your jab yet? Well, I've got not one, but two guests this time on The Learning Hack, who are both in different ways doing their very best to make sure that pretty soon, no matter where you live on this troubled globe, the answer to that question will be a resounding yes. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning Learning is is cool. Learning is cool. We first covered the pandemic on this podcast back in March 2020. And pretty soon, as the true scale of the crisis emerged, it began to be a part of every conversation we had. We haven't really focused on it specifically for a while, but since then, the conversation has changed. If last year was all about lockdowns and logistical logjams, this year is more about variants and vaccines. And learning plays a vital part. In fact, the most vital part. COVID has learned that it can spread faster by rapidly developing new variants. So the question is, can we vaccinate the world fast enough to outpace the virus's ability to change and mutate? It's a race. Who can learn faster, COVID or us? My guests on The Learning Hack this time might be able to give us some clues. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact. Who are they? Hack Facts. This episode is a twofer, two guests for the price of one. Mark Howells is VP and Head of Global Talent and Learning at AstraZeneca, developers of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine AZD1222, one of the leading weapons in the fight back against the global pandemic. Raida Sadki, President of the Geneva Learning Foundation, is an old friend of the podcast. He leads a Swiss nonprofit that connects learning leaders to research, invent and trial breakthrough approaches for new learning, talent and leadership, with a focus on immunisation and other critical issues in global health. Both of these guys have had pretty tumultuous years at the centre of the fight back against COVID. Mark has been involved at strategic level in AstraZeneca, whose astonishingly fast development of their vaccine was hailed as a miracle of modern science. Meanwhile, Rada has been helping to connect up health professionals across frontiers in bottom-up initiatives of rapid learning, spreading the knowledge of what works on the ground. Jay Curtis, Head of Themes. What themes emerged? Pivot is an overused word, John, usually associated with startups. But the story Mark tells of how a large organisation like AstraZeneca completely changed its focus to produce the vaccine, which was not a primary area for the company previously, is really quite extraordinary. Clearly, there were things he couldn't get into. Yes, there were PR minders. But it was fascinating nonetheless, while Rader was much more unbuttoned. He shoots from the hip. There was a major theme of leadership in his section. The way a crisis like the pandemic brings leadership, and the failings of, and sometimes the lack of, to the fore. This was a really interesting pair of interviews. One from near the top of a global farmer organisation. The other from someone very much connecting up those close to the ground. Two different perspectives but the picture emerges of people in different contexts working very hard on learning and change to fight a common enemy. Mark Howes, welcome to The Learning Hack and thanks for taking the time today. Can you describe your role at AstraZeneca and your strategic priorities for learning there? Thank you, John, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, So my role at AstraZeneca is I head up uh, talent and development, which includes uh, all learning and leadership development across the organisation. In terms of some of the strategic priorities we're working on, we're very much building uh, our our capabilities, growing a culture of lifelong learning across the organisation, and essentially building an environment where The 80,000 people that work for AstraZeneca continue to skill, adapt, grow new capabilities and preparing themselves to be leaders of today, but also leaders of the future. People within AstraZeneca must have a unique perspective on the pandemic over the last year since you've seen, you've been seen as an important part of the solution, you know, no pressure there, uh, as uh, a, a company that has one of the leading vaccines. So what's it been like for you and your team in the last year? 
first thing to say is it, it, it feels uh, like an incredible privilege and an honor to be part of the organization that is playing such an important role along with so many others in tackling this incredible health crisis. In terms of my team and I, we've been very much focused on how we continue to nurture and develop the talent within our workforce, ensuring that people feel able to continue to and thrive within this complex environment, but that they still have the ability to learn, adapt, grow, and that that isn't paused during the pandemic. Hmm. I think on a broader basis, you know, the entire organization has had to adapt like never before. Um, you know, the, the vaccine environment is not essentially one of our core business areas historically. Um, mm -hmm. We've always been focused on other therapeutic areas. So the organization has pivoted to supporting the vaccine work in an enormous way, but in a very rapid and agile way. And on that basis, you know, the organization has had to learn and unlearn and relearn so many new things as part of that, while also serving the needs of the patients that have always been you know, core to our business in oncology, cardiovascular metabolism, mm. and the respiratory disease areas, which are the, the, the primary areas that we normally focus on. Mm. So that, that's interesting that it, it, it wasn't as big a focus before, and, and that part of the organization must have had to get a lot bigger, a lot quicker. To, to do the amazing thing you've done to develop that vaccine so quickly. Absolutely. And it's, you know, I think that's something that we really pride ourselves on is that AstraZeneca as an organization, we, we've always invested in developing leaders that can operate in a volatile and predictable environment. And, and how do you use, you know, the networks that you have, the skills within your organization, the partnerships that you have with other, you know, healthcare and health bodies externally to bring the best solutions to patients. And this has been a journey for both, you know, the leaders within AstraZeneca and how they've adapted to it, but also it's been a real testament to the agility of our people. You know, I, I feel incredibly privileged, like I said earlier, I, I get to work with some incredibly smart people on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, world leaders in their field, but also deep expertise that can apply their skills and knowledge to difficult problems, navigate their way through it, and continue to stay focused on how we make a difference to patients. And I think that's been a testament to what we've done in our core business areas, but also the way that we've really engaged with the, the challenge of the vaccine and working with our partners in the Oxford Jenner Institute. There must be some very particular learning and talent needs to address and I'd imagine you've got a very wide range of skills to, to, to bring forward. And when you have to um, change the organization and move very quickly to uh, develop the vaccine as you had, what particular issues have come up out of that? And how have you dealt with them? Well, I think one of the, you know, as you say, with a population of nearly 80,000 people and across mm -hmm. 100 countries, we, we have a very broad spectrum of skills uh, and expertise areas. What we've been trying to do is really focus on, you know, how do we stay agile as an organization? You know, the skills we have today aren't necessarily all the same skills that we will need in the next 12 months, 18 months, even further out into five years. And it's how do we help the organization evolve and develop those skills in an agile way? We use data and analytics in a, as a core component of our methodology of predicting what skills we have, what skills do we need in the future? And we use a, what we call it a four B's methodology. What do we need to buy in terms of acquiring new skills through hiring? What do we need to build in terms of investment in development and growth of skills that we have, but maybe need to scale them up? What do we need to borrow? And that could be leveraging expertise from other organizations, could be through temporary hires, bringing specialist niche areas in. And the fourth one is around bots. So what do we need to automate that can be standardized activities or processes that freeze up some of the, the human skills and capabilities to work on things that have a higher value or are potentially less you know, standardized or repeatable activities? So the four Bs is a way that we really leverage that data. Mm -hmm. That then informs 
our investments around learning, development, where do we need to accelerate and grow capabilities, and how do we build some of our talent development and learning interventions in service of that agenda. So it, it's a holistic approach that starts with data and the business strategy and then pulls through in terms of capabilities build. And it's a sort of virtuous circle that we keep going around. Yeah. That, that sounds like a kind of description of a, of a sort of steady state um, process. I'm sort of wondering over the last year how much things have had to kind of completely change. I mean, uh, it, it, it's kind of the equivalent when you talk to defence people and they say we have a steady state way of managing things. And then we have, you know, when you've actually got a conflict going on, it changes to a very different mode. In leadership terms, you know, um, have you had to lead differently during this period of the last year? In terms of, yeah, I, it, it may sound like steady state, but for us what it builds in is a continuous improvement and a... Yeah. a a sort of lean cycle, if you like, of plan, do, check, act, which allows you to continually adapt. So there's not a steady state and crisis environment. There's one of continual change and evolution that is responding okay. to that need. So when we look at leadership development within our organization, we focus on five key themes. One of how do you lead in a patient-centric way? So how do you put the patient at the center of everything we do? How do you learn to adapt, evolve, and thrive in digital disruption? And how do you use digital as a part of your strategy deployment and execution? How do you lead in a sustainable way? And sustainability, both you know, not just the environmental aspect, but sustainable business models uh, that can continually grow and adapt. How do you then think about operating that volatile and predictable environment when you bring that together and then the fifth one is around how do you lead in an inclusive way? So how do you maximize the, the diversity of knowledge, insights, perspectives, neurodiversity within your organization, and also the psychological safety that you create in order to make that innovation thrive in your business? So we bring all of these factors together to enable us to adapt and evolve. In terms of the pandemic, what it's made us do is, if from a learning point in perspective, perspective, it's we've had to adapt and move to a fully virtual environment. And we moved all of our leadership offerings and um, development offerings fully virtual within six weeks of the pandemic. And what we've been able to see is by the use of technology and creating essentially a Spotify type of environment for learning where people can access learning on any device, anywhere it builds around them, we've actually seen an increase in the consumption of learning and participation in learning activity during the pandemic. And it's actually gone up 170% from the previous year. Hmm. So in this new environment, we've been able to provide our people with the tools, a technology and way of staying connected to adapt and grow at the point when they need it most, but also enabling them to learn in the flow of work. So they're not having to go somewhere different for it. They can learn in micro learning, bite-sized chunks. They can stay connected. Mm. And this has enabled us to continue to evolve as a business right the way through the pandemic. And this includes activities that we have done with the top 150 of our organization, very immersive, deep lead executive leadership development to help our leaders continue to, you know, innovate and drive and be resilient in, in this new environment, as well as the things that we've continued to pull through for all other levels in the organization. So it's been an interesting challenge, but I think I feel like we've been successful in it. So that's really interesting because in a way that's counterintuitive. You know, normally when there's a big panic on, everybody says, oh, right, well, we'll put off that learning till a bit later because we have to be doing a lot of doing. You're saying you've been doing more learning during the pandemic. What, what's going on there? Is it that going digital has made it easier to do more? So people are doing more. Some people have perhaps been furloughed and, you know, have, have, have a bit of time on their hands to do learning. Or is it that in this kind of uh, new world that we've we've all entered, people had to learn some things to adapt to it? What What's the, the driver there? So you know, we, we were fortunate as an organization that we we didn't furlough a, a single employee during the entire pandemic. Oh, and, okay. Right. 
everybody's continued to be fully engaged and in many ways people have, have been working significantly harder than, than previously because of the new activities and, and the, the different environment. I think it comes down to the fact that we recognize that when you know, the organization is having to adapt and evolve to a new you know, context, new landscape, new challenges, new opportunities, we also need to make sure that our people and as an organization, we continue to build a habit of lifelong learning. And that's something that we've been cultivating over the last few years. You know, if you think of the shelf life of skills and the advent of digital and the fourth industrial revolution as it's been described, what we see as critical for our people is an ability to learn, unlearn and relearn and a habit of curiosity. And if you bake that into the mindset of the company in terms of how we invest in development, as I mentioned, the shelf life of skills, when I look at some industries, you know, if I look at technology, um, that shelf life of skills and relevance could be anything between 18 months and 36 months. We're a life sciences company, therefore I would say ours is probably more between five and seven years. Hmm. But in order to stay relevant, we want people to continually adapt and learn new information and skills and capabilities on an ongoing basis. And it's a bit like you know, when somebody says, do you prefer to go to the gym at the weekend for an hour and a half and feel like it's one big workout a week? Or do you do you know, the high impact interval training, which means it could be 15 minutes a day, which has more impact and it forms new habits that are sustainable? We try and think about learning in the same way. How do you learn a little every day rather than trying to learn a lot once a year, every six months or so? That means you're constantly adapting and evolving individuals, teams, and the organization towards new opportunities and challenges. So it's been a culture and a mindset shift that we've engaged with. So the pandemic has been an awful thing, but it's given a bit of a boost to learning technologies in many ways uh, that um, people in the industry have, have very much noted and some have been a bit embarrassed about because um, they're all working harder and um, some people are earning more money. Uh, have you seen a lot of change in the use of digital in your organisation Um due to this? And if so, how much of that change is long lasting? I mean, you, you did talk a, a, a little bit about that, but I'd, I'd kind of like, particularly like to focus on that balance between face-to-face -face and digital, you know, how much is, isn't ever going back to face-to-face, -to -face, do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting dilemma because I, I think, you know, I think so many of us have felt the, the loss of that social interaction that you have in the workplace and, how that also shapes and informs, you know, culture, creativity, innovation amongst teams. But what we've also recognized is we've been able to solve incredibly difficult, complex um, problems on, at scale and done it virtually. It, it's grown new collaboration skills in a way that we've not experienced previously. So I think we will go back to a blended level I think the virtual piece has been very, very successful for us in the way that we've rolled out the learning offerings. But I think there is still a piece there that in terms of building networks and connections across a large global company like this, there's still a lot to be said about bringing people together periodically mm. in order to create those relationships. Because when you're on a Zoom call, you, people connect in the space that they're in, in that virtual environment. But as soon as they end, there's no sidebar conversations or the walk to the coffee machine to follow up on a theme or a topic of interest um, or to explore an idea that could be of mutual interest in, in different working groups. We still need that. And I think that's where we'll look to bring that in in a purposeful way while balancing, still leveraging the virtual piece that has been very, very successful and impactful. Hmm. It, it's been an interesting kind of experiment or control group experiment in the way because we haven't had face-to-face um, and I'll ask you a question I've asked other people as well, is do you think that, that when it is finally all over, thanks to you guys and your vaccines, I've, I've had my two jabs of, of your product and I'm very pleased to have to, about that. 
when we finally get on the other side of this, is it going to be bring on the roaring 20s? Let's just kind of forget about those last two horrible years and and get back to the way things were as much as possible and never ever talk about the pandemic. Or is it going to be that a lasting change is made? And, and we'll look back at the, the, the kind of the years before it in the way that people after the Second World War looked back at the pre-war period as being very different. I can't help but feel that I think we're not going to retract to all of our ways of working pre the pandemic. I think this has given us new insight into new ways of working. It's pushed every organization to really embrace digital working and digital tools in a different way than prior to the pandemic. I think if you'd have asked most companies about their rollouts of mass use of virtual working, there, there would have been lots of hesitation and it would have been a very piecemeal approach. The pandemic pushed everybody off the cliff in the same way into the digital world and accelerated that digital transformation. And I think within that, there are things that we've learned about ourselves that are new, there have been new revelations and things that we can absolutely leverage as strengths to go forward. I think, as I mentioned before, people have been able to come together very quickly, very efficiently, and work through complex programs and, and problems and, and have a lasting impact. But we still need that element of how do we still connect people to build culture, collaboration, and really take those relationships to a different level. And I think we still need an element of coming together face to face to do that. Hmm. It just makes us think about how do we use the workplaces in a different way? How do we continue to carry the lessons learned from the pandemic into new ways of leading and leadership into the future so that managing in a sustained crisis is a new skill that we all have and managing and being resilient in that sustained crisis environment is a new skill that we have and these are just about building new muscles and learning new ways of leading and learning. Broadening the focus a bit, what are your hopes and fears for learning and talent more generally as we move forward from these difficult years? I don't think I have a fear, if I'm honest. I think I have a, um, I'm a more optimistic soul in, in regards to, for me, the, the advent of digital and the way the pandemic has, has impacted you know, every organisation in many ways, every individual is it's allowed a period of reflection. It's allowed a period of you know, reassessing where our strengths are, what our aspirations are, what our purpose is, and what do we want to do in terms of taking that forward? And I think that also allows us as learners and practitioners in learning to think about how do we service that need for continual skilling, that curiosity to learn something different, how do we look at our organization and say, you know, we hire really smart people. Um, but if I, most of the people that I interact with, very few people have, are still doing the same role that they left university doing. They've evolved and they may have had two or three careers between now and where they are. Hmm. How do we help people do that consciously and continue to adapt their skills and learn new careers and grow new careers. But also, I think the pandemic has, has helped organizations and countries look more broadly and say, how can we help each other? How can we make learning boundaryless? How can we share resources to lift others up and grow capabilities in society, not just within organizations? And that's something that AstraZeneca and I know a number of the big multinationals in Europe are currently working with the European Union on mm. is an ambition to reskill a million people over the next five years in new skills and capabilities that are relevant to what industry needs in the future. But it's leveraging the collective resources for the social good. Thank you very much for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You are data. You are data. You are data. You are data. Every pulse of your heart, every step you take, the place you travel to, the thing that gets your attention, it all leaves a trace in data. 
and the world reconfigures itself around you, moment to moment, based on that data. You are data. You are data. data has learned a lot about you over the years. Isn't it time you learned more about data? You are data. You are data. You are data. Data is a hot topic in learning right now, perhaps the hottest. But when you look at what's happened historically with learning analytics, it's hard to deny that it's been a little bit stuck. Stuck in the first two levels of Kirkpatrick. Stuck in what David Wilson and Charles Jennings have called the conspiracy of convenience. Stuck in a lack of capability, money and time to evaluate. So how can we get ourselves out of this endless Mobius loop of wanting to do it all but ending up not actually doing very much. I've talked to a lot of experts and practitioners, and the result is a whole series of guides and resources that Learning Pool will be releasing to help you map your way out of that loop. Download the first of these now. The Data and Learning White Paper. You are data. You are data. You are data. The rest of the episode is given over to an interview with Rada Sadki. In a first for the Learning Hack podcast, this was initially live streamed to Rada's followers during the interview. That's why we both look so nervous, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube. What follows is an edited version of our chat, but there's a link in show notes to the unedited stream for completists. <laughs> Warm welcome to you, to those of us who are uh, following us on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, Twitter, or Facebook. <laughs> this is a special kind of live stream. I'm here with uh, uh, John Helmer, and um, he's actually going to um, interview um, me in the context of our ongoing work around uh, the uh, uh, the COVID uh, vaccine. So uh, let me see if we can if I can set this up so you can see John as well as me. Okay, that's going to be, yeah. Um, and so this is an experiment. We just thought we would invite uh, those of you who are following us and some of you we know are coming for, you know, so coming every time, are really um, uh, dedicated and loyal followers. We appreciate that. Just wanted to give you a behind the scenes peek um, at what we're going to be doing with uh, John. So over to you, John. Hi, everybody. Reda, great to see you again. Welcome back to The Learning Hack. Uh, last time we spoke was in May of 2020, when the true scope of the global pandemic was becoming horribly apparent and you were mobilizing health professionals through your organization, the Geneva Learning Foundation, to share learning and education across borders and boundaries to help beat it. A year on now, we're in the throes of getting the world vaccinated with some sort of end in sight. Can you describe the journey you and your organization have been on this last year? So the yeah, the funny thing is, I think what you know happened to us <laughs> is what happened to everyone else. Uh, um, and having worked for a long time in disaster management, um, in humanitarian response, having had the personal experience of facing a previous pandemic, um, you know, I did what everyone else does in those situations: is you tr you see you you figure out how resilient you are, often without having to think about it, and you figure out how to learn faster than uh, than you ever have. So that's a personal level. My organization, the Geneva Learning Foundation, went through the same you know the same throws that every organization went through. So it's it's completely exceptional and mundane at the same time. In our case, we were in the middle of building the. Um, uh, the Teach to Reach program. This was a program with more than 3,000 participants in over 90 countries, uh, figuring out how immunization training um, was going to, um, could be improved. And the irony is that even though we're fully digital, we focused, we chose deliberately to focus on face-to-face -face training because we felt that in immunization, in the field of immunization, the face-to-face -face training event is still the norm and offering some fancy digital framework and so on would be beside the point, would be premature. <laughs> yes, uh, well, so you were and, wrong, as wrong-footed as everybody else by having to exactly. suddenly take everything digital. That's really interesting, right? 
Um, and at the same time, we were ready because everything we do is digital, doesn't rely on face-to-face -face interactions, doesn't, doesn't presume that physical encounters are superior to remote digital ones. Um, and so we called on, I think it's around sort of, we took a long time actually, it's like mid-April, we issue a call where we say to people, guess what, on our immunization platform. And at the time it looks like, you know, I remember... You know, the, uh, 1984, the announcement on the White House lawn in the United States, um, the, you know, the, the, the chief of the health services or whatever, the, basically the, the American CDC. Minister of Health, mm -hmm. yeah, saying, making an announcement, we will have a vaccine within six months. And then 30 years later, I remember working as, a, as an activist in the trenches and remembering that and recalling that overly optimistic pronouncement you know, being actually quite a quite misleading and quite hurtful and damaging, and so I had the same reaction when I heard pronouncements about and predictions about you know, uh, that a that a COVID nineteen vaccine could suddenly appear, um, and uh, so we worked on that basis. We worked on the basis that there would be no vaccine; that this was about prevention and information, right. and um, and at the same time, so we built what turned into the COVID-19 Peer Hub, building on the impact accelerator work that you and I have done, have discussed in the past. Mm. Um, and we did it uh, with immunization professionals from all over the world. And at the time there were 80 million children being placed under threat, not because of COVID directly, but because of a consequence of the restrictions on, on, the, on, the, on movement, because of the fears and misinformation, uh, caregivers basically literally just stopped bringing their children for vaccines. So vaccines off, uh, you know, children off of vaccine schedules means children at risk from vaccine preventable diseases and basically potentially dying stupid deaths. <laughs> yes. uh, so there was both like a, there's a, <laughs> a tremendously interesting learning and knowledge problem with respect to our mission. Um, and we focused everything we had on that, just like many other organizations that ended up in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, of this. And we realized that actually the work we had been doing in immunization now since 2016, um, mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, towards the end of the year, we realized that what we were doing, our work, was potentially of interest to everyone. It mm -hmm. always had been. Public health is about, you know, the protection of everyone. But all of a sudden, there was more intense interest um, and um, resources, um, concentration, you know, on immunization than there has ever been before, perhaps since yeah. the big, I don't know, polio campaigns in the 50s or, you know, the, in the previous century or something like that. Mm. But then, like everything else, COVID turned that, a lot of that on its head because it wasn't children that were necessarily the the, the focus here. It was kind of older people and who, who 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 COVID was really kind of targeting, and those were the people that had to be protected. Where I, I previous immunization campaigns have all been about children. I remember as a child in the fifties getting um, uh, getting immunized. Absolutely. I mean, there's a whole. You know, debate amongst immunization experts, which I think has some implications for just uh, learning professionals and, and learning leaders um, around what that change means. My understanding is in the past, attempts to, introdu to introduce vaccines that were not for children, so say for adolescent girls, for a human papilloma virus, uh, papilloma virus HPV, um, you know, have run into problems. And um, and have been challenge, you know, have been more challenging than other vaccines. Um, and at the same time, there's a yeah, there's this is where I think the lens of learning uh, and leadership are especially relevant. What we've seen in the last since November, when we started to do scenario planning around vaccine introduction. So this is a network, the largest platform of immunization professionals in the world in developing countries. Yes, uh, and it is about not only us sending information you know, two people, but it is about people connecting uh, to each other. And what's interesting from a learning perspective is in the face of a challenge of that implies fairly radical changes in competencies and knowledge and skills and behavior and, uh, and in how you think about your role, we saw that same, yeah, that same sort of motivation and that can-do attitude making a tremendous difference. And mm. it also turned out, uh, what, <laughs> one other observation, uh, François Gass, uh, uh, a friend and a, a legend in the world of immunization, um, he would 
basically enter a country and 12 to 18 months later, there would be no more tetanus. Tetanus would be eradicated. Huh. Um, and he bemoaned the fact that in the country where he lives, um, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, uh, vaccination efforts are extremely slow. Um, and he speaks with you know, um, colleagues in uh, Francophone West Africa and other parts of Africa where um, that have actually more experience, more know-how with campaigning, with setting up large, uh, massive vaccination campaigns than people you know, in the in the affluent in the more affluent countries do. Yeah. So there's some really interesting paradoxes in terms and and some of the assumptions about like who knows what, <laughs> and how we know what we know um, about epist epistemology that uh, that are being challenged, um, and that if the global community, you know, recognizes the significance of those, could be, you know, could lead to a change in the some of the prevailing paradigms around how we think about learning. Um, and leadership in the field of immunization. And I think that change in paradigm is absolutely essential if COVID-19 vaccine introduction is to be you know, successful in actually protecting all populations everywhere uh, from uh, the coronavirus. So the, the story has been one of, okay, the, the, the resources are available, um, all the work gets accelerated, uh, the rug's pulled under from your feet um, in certain respects in that what you're facing now is not necessarily what you faced in the past and so on. Can you explain a bit about the, the mechanism that has evolved over, over the year to, to deal with that situation? Um, specifically, can you explain how you work within the ACT-A mechanism and COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, and maybe explain to start with what both of those are? Sure. So... I think so. In the past, you had, um, say, the United Nations system, which is the member states, um, and things were simple then. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, knowledge and learning would trickle up to the you know, to the body tasked with compiling and summarizing the best available knowledge and expertise. Member states would then adopt that as the recommendation, and countries would then command and control top down, carry out those uh, and implement those recommendations. Obviously, we live in a far more complex world, and there's a long history over several decades of, you know, sort of the way catalytic, the role played by catalytic philanthropy, the creation of sort of these bodies that are actually networks, you know, uh, that are beginning sort of networks of institutions. And I would say that's what the, um, you know, the, uh, the COVAX, which is focused on vaccine delivery, and then the ACT, which is you know, the, the, it's this ma machinery at the international level connected to countries um, that is not quite so top-down or command and control as, um, as, as things used to be in the past. Now, where we fit in is that, you know, these sort of existing, these remain primarily top-down approaches towards the shared goal of, <laughs> you know, uh, of um, yeah, fighting the pandemic, um, eradicating the coronavirus once and for all would be nice. Would be a nice, to, you know, would be a, a the cherry on top. Um, and so we believe this goal will be strengthened if it's strengthened by uh, more cross cutting or bottom up or you know, call it what you will peer and action learning opportunities for national and subnational staff to learn from and support each other. So these are the people who actually delivering the vaccines. And yes, they haven't necessarily delivered vaccines for adults in the past, but now they have to. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And um, there's some, you know, so, so that's where we situate ourselves. We're, you know, we're both sort of, we believe that there's real power in connecting people on the ground who are delivering vaccines with that international machinery, which is otherwise quite disconnected mm -hmm. in a peculiar way from like, you know, so in a way, maybe, you know, probably deaf and maybe blind to a lot of the on the ground uh, activities and all of the sort of big data and, you know, so sort of uh, AI for uh, public health, digital health. Um, all of that stuff only works if uh, the people on the ground, the people who deliver vaccines are actually involved and recognized not just the sort of sources of data or data points, but recognized for their leadership, for their talent 
and for their potential to sort of grow that talent and leadership to face up to these uh, to these challenges. So we see ourselves increasingly as sort of building that bridge between the, the different levels of a system. And we've seen in small but significant ways because of the scale we work at, um, how much of a difference when those levels are connected to each other in the right way. So not an extractive um, mining exercise, not a condescending you know, sort of bit of tourism to validate what you think needs to be done or to sort of, um, you know, to, to, to validate your, poli your existing policies, but to actually question your governing values. So what uh, Argyra is called double loop learning um, yeah. is not only about listening, but is actually being ready to reframe and rethink how you're listening, why you're listening, what you will do with what you hear. Um, those are the kinds of things where, where we're, you know, we see ourselves increasingly as advocates for, for the type of learning that is mostly absent from the other spaces uh, that exist within immunization. And that leads us on to a, a, another theme of, of, of your work that I, I know that leadership is a particular focus of yours. Um, can you talk a little about leadership in the context of COVID and uh, especially vaccination? So I think of, of someone like uh, some of the leaders at the global level and what that leadership actually means. Um, I think, you know, and then I think about the people that we interact with every day in our in our programs. Remarkable individuals who are working in a health facility in the district, uh, maybe in the capital city, and the national team responsible for uh, for immunization. Um, and I actually observe the same dynamics of sort of you know, um, striving to be more than what you are in order to achieve, in order to learn, in order to uh, respond and adapt to the challenges posed by the, uh, uh, by the pandemic. And I'm sure there's stuff that's going to keep anthropologists, you know, other social scientists busy for decades in terms of sort of the consequences and how people have, you know, have adapted and so on. But um, from that knowledge and learning perspective, you know, it really feels like knowledge like who owns it, what is the knowledge that matters, how we know what we know, it's just kind of broken free from its moorings, from its shackles. Um, and, you know, um, there's a, you know, the, the way if you think about this information from a learning perspective, you know, like if you're an instructional designer, you're designing the COVID-19 vaccine delivery program. <laughs> yes. uh, how does misinformation fit into that? How do you respond to it? How do you recognize like where what its sources are and what are the effective responses? Um, you know that that those are the questions that um, that I see these uh, leaders from the local to the global levels, and we're talking with people from all those levels. Um, are all kind of like instructional designers now. <laughs> yes, uh, And uh, just like a lot of instructional designers, finding that the tools that date from the previous century of, you know, figure out what the learning objectives are, uh, develop the set of activities and then assessments that will measure whether people have achieved those learning objectives. I mean, it's not that those are no longer valid principles, but they're certainly not sufficient to actually solve the problems at hand. Uh, so we're seeing people being challenged and growing incredibly quickly as a, you know, as a result. I think I'm convinced there's a new, basically a new generation of immunization leaders that is you know, emerging, that is going to emerge from this baptism by fire that is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, I do see also you know, um, a resistance to behavior change. You know, um, especially at the at the so-called higher levels of the system, so global and regional levels, of people who actually, even in the face of such a crisis, would rather keep doing things the way they have been doing them. And yeah. again, from a, that learning and leadership perspective, that resistance to change is to be expected. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, change is hard, um, and I actually think the learning sciences have more than a few things to offer to help people at all levels in leading that change. I mentioned an end in sight at the beginning of this interview, but although there's more optimism about in the richer nations at least and those that have managed to get the vaccination going quicker, uh, it's far from over. It, you know, if you looked at the UK sort of um, take on the whole thing, generally it's like, oh, 
let's get back to normal. Let's get to, go to pop festivals. Let's get down the pub, all the rest of it. Um, but when you look at the rest of the world, there are huge challenges still. In India, currently people are dying at the rate of 4,000 a week. I think that's official figures. It could be an undercount, could be much higher. And each new variant seems to raise fresh fears. You know, suddenly the, the Indian variant comes up and everybody's, oh my God, maybe it's not really open. Are we learning fast enough in this crisis, in your view? Um, and also, how do you see the way forward? Yeah, so on the uh, on the first question is a little <laughs> easier to to answer than the um, you know the, the 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 broader second. I mean, on the specific, so no, we're not learning fast enough. Uh, we, you know, um, and that resistance to change, you know the. Um, and specifically, your know, behavior change by, you know, within the global community. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that there are new ways to learn, um, new, you know, sort of, that could provide the global immunization community with tools to accelerate that learning. Uh, however, um, that immunization space is mired in this legacy of, Actually, that where innovation was not needed, you did not learn need to learn too fast for a long time. It's one of a few development interventions, uh, uh, and I may have said this in the previous uh, uh, in the previous exchange we had. You know, it's one of a few development interventions that just worked. You know, top down, uh, command and control. You line up the kids in the in the uh, village, and they oh, they stop dying from stupid diseases. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, and um, so that one concern is just sort of. If the realization that there's certainly the realization and the awareness that there's a need to learn faster and better, um, but what concerns me is whether the you know, so whether the, the the members of that global community um, are willing to you know, sort of explore what double loop learning implies in terms of changing their behaviors, in terms of rethinking the frameworks on which they operate, in terms of how they spend their time, who they listen to. Uh, so really thinking their learning and their leadership um, and seeing that, understanding that that is one of the keys that could make the difference between, you know, uh, between success and failure in vaccine introduction. Um, on the second question, the, the way forward, I mean, you know, um, there are real real scary risks um, of that are actually in part consequences of that resistance to change. And even in the face of the opportunity to change ways, change how we lead, change how we come to know, um, you know, that, that, sort of, that do keep me awake at night. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my concern is that some of the people, uh, some of whom have become friends, some of whom I know, you know, even though we've never met in a physical space, uh, I know and trust and consider to be almost like family who are doing this remarkable job on the ground of actually delivering vaccines, actually following everything that the international community is throwing at them and asking them to do what their Ministry of Health is asking them to do. Um, I'm afraid of waking up one morning and seeing on the one of the telegram groups that we have um, where we're getting this constant stream of information that you know, uh, somebody was attacked by people you know, nourished by misinformation, by um, not by ignorance, but actually yes, uh, uh, people who figured out how to use very effective ways to learn to nefarious ends or, mm -hmm. you know, reading or, or hearing that uh, a testimonial from someone who says that their health facility was attacked or burned down, um, you know, as, as you know, and so I think there's a real sense of responsibility. And I do believe that the learning sciences, the tools of learning. Um, if we're willing ourselves as learning leaders to abandon <laughs> that vestigial legacy of uh, of training of the old ways that of, uh, that have led us in many cases to to, to a dead end, um, and sort of embrace the new and the unknown and be willing to take the risks and to navigate those unknowns, convince learning sciences and you know, um, uh, or organizations that practice learning can actually make. A tremendous contribution. Like it, it may turn out that you know, uh, figuring out better, faster ways to learn, rethinking how we come to know, uh, is actually one of the keys to you know, um, you know, in the long term, uh, not only ending this pandemic but preventing the next ones. Thank you very much, Rita. 
that's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Mark, Raider, and to our sponsors, Learning Pool. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. Please subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. You can tweet me at John Helmer or reach me through my website, johnhelmerconsulting.com. Coming up on The Learning Hack. Next time, we're getting just in time, just enough and just for me with the ultimate guru of workflow learning, Mr. Five Moments of Need himself, Bob Mosher. It's a good one. Don't miss it. Smash that subscribe button now. Stay safe, learning people. Now I finally get it. And what we're seeing, though, is people we work with, people I work with every day, and and uh, and appreciate and enjoy uh, you have sort of enjoy interacting with while aware of the challenges they're facing in their daily work in delivering vaccines. Um, really, a kind of coming to consciousness that you only see in crises. <laughs> <laughs>